Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. And Happy New Year! This episode is for the week of 28th of December 2020 to the 3rd of January 2021. We would first like to send, send a shout out to our friends at Go Taikonauts and at Spacewatch.Global, both excellent sources for news on the space industry. This week, we will bring you updates on a new Chinese airline taking its maiden flight, the celebration of 50 years of diplomatic relations between China and Italy and its ramifications for space, uh, an update on some flat panel antenna manufacturing news. But first, Jean will bring us some updates on the Deep Blue Aerospace, uh, 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 Deep Blue Aerospace one of China's uh, leading commercial launch companies. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. And take it away, Sean, on DBA. Sure. So. First things first, Deep Blue Aerospace, their wet dress rehearsal, and some updates on their 2021 calendar. For maybe our viewers that don't know the company, Deep Blue Aerospace is a launch company that was founded in 2017, based in Beijing. And it's among what, what we call the um, second generation launch companies, meaning that they came after the first wave of um, companies that were founded in 2015. Um, there were mainly four companies, which was um, Landspace, iSpace, Linkspace, and OneSpace. And speaking of, of one space, it's interesting to note that the current CEO of Deep Blue Aerospace, uh, a guy called um, Chue Liang, was a former VP of one space. So it's it's worth noting that we have some of the top management in the initial first generation co launch companies that moved on to um, form the second generation launch companies. Now back to this the piece of news last week, Deep Blue Aerospace they posted on their social media images of their their progress and notably the completion of their um, wet dress rehearsal of uh, uh, their experimental rocket called the Nebula M number one, uh, basically an experimental rocket. And so what this consisted in basically was um, basically erecting the rocket, also connecting the hydraulics and the electronic systems, and it meant also chilling down um, the fuel and notably the, the oxygen to cryogenic temperatures, um, and then loading that onto the rocket, and after that, draining it from the rocket. So this went on successfully. Nebula M is actually not really a, a product of the uh, Nebula rocket family of Deep Blue Aerospace. It's actually, it's, an, it's I mean, it's barely seven meters tall. It's an experimental rocket that's there just um, to trial the vertical takeoff, vertical landing technology, which will be an important building block for um, for Deep Blue Aerospace. Um, so what Deep Blue Aerospace is planning next, now that the wet dress rehearsal is completed, is to do some static firings um, somewhere I would... They, so they announced um, after Spring Festival in China. So I think at the earliest, we're looking at, at the end of February or more likely um, March or, or April. And um, and if that goes as 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 planned, then they will proceed to hops, similar to what SpaceX did with the Grasshopper. Basically, it's uh, having the Nebula M uh, lift off, reach a certain altitude, come back to the ground, and then do that with higher and higher altitudes. And um, maybe just a, a side note here: they would be the second or the third Chinese company ever to do that. Um, the first company being Link Space, that's been doing such experiments since 2015. And I think the more, more impressive one. Uh, was um, in in 2019 in August or July where they they reached several hundred meters. Deep Blue Aerospace they'd be the second or maybe the third because we know that iSpace also has uh, some sort of prototype of the of their uh, Hyperbola two rocket and they're also planning to do some hops this year if um, all things go well. Um, so yeah, that's basically it for this week's update on the on Deep Blue Aerospace. Do you have any thoughts, Blaine? Maybe on. So, so yeah, just to, so a quick question, um, and I, I know that you mentioned at the beginning, and I, I don't want to to contradict you, but you mentioned that they're based in Beijing, and and I believe that uh, they, in about mid twenty twenty, uh, moved their headquarters to Jiangsu, or at least that the the parent company of Deep Blue Aerospace now, or sort of the, so just just a quick digression here. Uh, a lot of Chinese new space companies, they will have sort of the parent company, and then they will have several kind of subsidiaries that are basically this company's same name, but then in some other province. So you'll have like Beijing Land Space Technologies Corp, and then you'll have Huzhou Land Space and Xi'an Land Space, etc., as sort of subsidiaries of the Beijing one. 
And and uh, DBA, Deep Blue Aerospace, as far as I know, the, the sort of parent company in mid-2020 was changed to Jiangsu Deep Blue Aerospace, uh, based in Nantong, I believe. Mm. And, and this occurred around the time of the company's pre-A round of funding. Um, and that pre-A round of funding did include a sort of Nantong... Um, like a science technology investment fund as one of its investors. So, so again, I, I don't want to, uh, to contradict your point about them being headquartered in Sorry. Beijing. I'm not 100% sure, and I don't have access to uh, a, a VPN uh, to check Tianyan Cha these days, so I can't actually verify that. But, but I, I do think that they're um, they're doing a lot more in, in Jiangsu now, which is interesting. I, I think Nantong, um, in particular, the city that is. Uh, probably third tier city in Jiangsu. It's also the home of the Galaxy Space Super Factory that we would have mentioned uh, in previous episodes. And so I, I think we have the Nantong government seemingly being quite aggressive about supporting space companies. They were also a participant in Galaxy Space's most recent uh, round of funding back in, let's call it November of 2020. Um, so, so again, this is a, an example of, of a, a city government, in this case, Nantong, uh, seemingly being quite aggressive in, in um, in trying to attract companies. Uh, one other point that I would then mention about this kind of cluster building in Nantong with DBA and with Galaxy Space is the proximity to Shanghai. So you have Nantong, Jiangsu is probably uh, maybe an hour or so from Shanghai by high-speed rail. And uh, as we, we spoke uh, in our upcoming episode with, with Comset, with Donglu, um, he had mentioned that one of the, the attractive elements of Tangshan, the city in Hebei where, where Comset has set up, is its relative proximity to Beijing. So it's about an hour away. So you have lower cost of land, more supportive government, and still proximity to a, a big center. So I guess in this case, um, with DBA and with, with, again, Galaxy Space and others uh, clustering around Jiangsu, um, you would have probably SAST, I guess, would be the largest space company in Shanghai. But then you also have CAS uh, or, um, uh, institutes as well. And so I think you're going to see a lot of, of this kind of development of these clusters around major cities, and you're going to see the second and third tier cities having some opportunities to specialize in, in specific things. So um, it would be interesting to, to do a little bit of a deep dive on what exactly is DBA doing in, in Nantong that they were not doing in Beijing. Um, but I would certainly imagine that um, as a kind of, uh, as, as you mentioned, John, a, a second generation launch company, there would be a certain attraction in being able to go to a city that has a lower cost of, of everything, uh, such as Nantong. So um, yeah, those are my my um, the, yeah. the proximity yeah. that the and the proximity you mentioned with with Shanghai is is interesting. I'm just looking it up here on on Baidu Maps, and you realize that Nantong is really just on the border with Shanghai. You have you have Chongming Island, which is the probably the most northern part of um, Shanghai, and then just go above that, and it's directly Nantong mm. City, and and you have the Yangtze River that flows between the two. So I would. I would guess in terms of logistics and proximity, there's, yeah, it's it's definitely really in the outskirts of, of Shanghai. Indeed. So speaking of Shanghai, we did see this week the launch of a new airline uh, that is, well, it was actually founded in February of 2020, but it took its maiden flight on the 28th of December. That being OTT Airlines, which I think is a pretty excellent name. OTT stands for 123 uh, Airlines, and the Chinese name Yi Er San is uh, 123. So uh, big fan. First flight was from Shanghai Hongqiao to Beijing Capital Airport. It is a subsidiary of China Eastern Airlines, and the noteworthy element of this flight is the fact that it was on an ARJ-21, so a Chinese manu a regional jet manufactured by, by Comac. Um, the airline's entire order book, as far as I know, is currently ARJ-21 and C919, so all sort of Chinese aircraft. Um, although many of these aircraft made with, with foreign components, as we did mention in our news update from the 7th to 13th of December. Um, but digressing, uh, so we have a, a OTT Airlines having its maiden flight, and it is a, uh, you could call it a an all Chinese airline in terms of its fleet at the moment. Um, I think it's, it's noteworthy that it's a, a subsidiary of China Eastern that probably gives it significant financial resources. Uh, I would also tend to imagine that it would be targeting sort of smaller cities in the Yangtze River Delta that are currently uh, not as connected by, by aircraft. So, I mean, these are, we're talking about regional jets and and um, probably these, the, the Shanghai to Beijing route is more of a, a publicity stunt or, or at least a, a sort of publicity drive effort. Um, one last side note, then I'll turn it over to Jean for his thoughts on uh, 
on on the OTT Airlines uh, maiden flight. Interesting that the the airline's name is derived from Lao Tzu's three principles of Taoism, uh, which is probably making it the most Taoist airline in the world. Although I I don't know that for a fact, but I would. I would say probably. Uh, John, any any thoughts on OTT Airlines or any other airlines that you know to be more Taoist than OTT? Going back to your point on the Beijing-Shanghai route, I think that, and as some articles have also mentioned, it is it is true that the ARJ-21 is not optimized for this sort of route. It's, it's a very packed route and slots at airports in Beijing and Shanghai are very precious. So I think definitely it was more of a stunt. Uh, it would make sense to put larger aircraft on on such um, high, you know, dense um, routes. Mm -hmm. um, and so my thoughts here on OTT, I think it's interesting to see here how the big three uh, state-owned airlines in China have adopted different strategies um, regarding Chinese manufactured aircraft, which are COMAC aircraft. Um, Air China and China Southern, well, basically all three airlines have ordered Chinese manufactured airlines. Air China and China Southern have decided to incorporate directly these aircraft into their fleet, and I'll put a picture up with the um, with the delivery of um, Air China and China Southern. On the other hand, China Eastern, as Blaine, you've explained, they've decided to create a subsidiary specifically dedicated to Chinese aircraft. So OTT Airlines will be uh, an airline that will specifically um, operate um, um, C919 and also ARJ21. And they also operate um, business business jets, but that's, that's sort of in another cat category. Um, so, just wanted to add that. Another thing also, and you've, you've also hinted at it a, a little bit, is that um, the ARJ-21, despite being a Chinese aircraft, still relies heavily on um, foreign-made technology, imported technology. But it's also, I think, important to note here that it's the ARJ-21 and also the C919 is are really excellent platforms um, for Chinese aerospace emerging manufacturers to test their systems um, on you know in on in an operational uh, environment and in, in not such a I'd say a restrictive um, certification um, regulations and I think that they are, they have natural access to to I mean to Comac for this sort of stuff and I I some examples that I'd give is for example for aircraft seats um, there's a company in Hubei that's called Jatai that makes aircraft seats and they were selected uh, by Comac to provide seats for the ARJ21 along with I think there's another foreign manufacturer I think it's Saffron. Um, and also Donica, they were selected, so a company that's based in Shenzhen, they were selected at the beginning of uh, 2020 uh, to provide onboard Wi-Fi systems for the ARJ21. So it's also a great platform for these emerging Chinese um, manufacturers to, to push out their, their equipment. Indeed. So I'm looking forward to my first opportunity to fly on OTT Airlines. I will make sure to bring my copy of the uh, Dao De Jing uh, on the, the flight just so I can read read that on this most uh, Taoist airline. So um, moving on to a celebration of 50 years of diplomatic relations between China and Italy. So we saw this week a virtual uh, virtual meeting between Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and his Italian counterpart Luigi Di Maio, uh, which the, uh, they discussed different areas of, of cooperation. And uh, the reason that we're bringing it up on this week's episode is that one of the areas that was apparently emphasized rather heavily was space. And uh, there was an announcement that Italy will have a small payload on the Chang'e 6 mission, which, uh, as we mentioned one or two weeks ago, um, will also involve France. Um, so this is uh, the, the latest example, I think, of, again, China having these sort of big ticket projects that most countries cannot afford to do on their own. And so you're having opportunities for other countries to participate as a uh, in a sort of secondary role. Um, so this article, which was taken from the South China Morning Post, um, it mentioned that Italy and China began cooperating in the space sector around 2011, and also that uh, Italy is expected to contribute to Chinese asteroid missions, uh, among others, moving forward. Last point that I'll mention before turning it over to Jean is that it, it's pretty interesting that you know Italy has historically done a lot of cooperation, certainly with ESA, but also with the US in, in the space sector. And now it seems like they are more open to China. And, and this is purely speculation by me, although I would tend to, well, it's purely speculation, but but I, I think there is a certain feeling in Italy that, um, you know, other European countries, most notably Germany, have 
had a very, very good run at selling a lot of things into the Chinese market. For example, if you look at the number of BMWs driving around Beijing and you compare it to the number of, say, Alfa Romeos or, or even you know, uh, Ferraris, although granted it's not an apples to apples comparison. Either way, the, the exports of German cars to China would have to be multiple times the value of the export of Italian cars. And this is the case in many industries. And so I think now you've, you've reached a point where um, Germany in particular seems to have kind of drawn a red line in the space sector to some extent in terms of doing business with China. Uh, we've seen uh, with Mineric, for example, having uh, left the, the market there. Um, and so it, it's conceivable that Italy would say, well, you know, maybe one of our value propositions when doing business with China vis-a-vis -vis some European country is going to be that we are less sensitive about certain technologies because you know what the germans uh, have been getting very you know fat dumb and happy on on selling lots of of cars to china for a very long time and so why not uh, and again that that fat dumb and happy germans that was me impersonating an italian uh, person that was not my my personal opinion on, on german so so john any any thoughts from you on germans or or fat dumb and happy europeans or any any other such things as it relates to the the 50th anniversary of china and italian uh, diplomatic relations Hmm. I, I actually, I'm not really surprised by this sort of um, a cooperation between Italy and, and China. I think that, um, first of all, Italy is, is, remains a very export oriented um, uh, country as compared to, say, a country like France. Um, and also, I think that Italy was one of the first, I think it's the only so far large economy in the European Union that has joined or that has signed some sort of memorandum of understanding with the Belt and Road in, in, in initiative. So definitely, I mm -hmm. think that China has been, I mean, Italy has been trying to, um, you know, establish closer ties with China. And that's, you know, that space is one of those applications is is I, in the continuity of, of yeah, these past um, cooperations. I'm trying to think of a pun involving when in Rome do as the Romans do, but I think that that's not that it's it's too early still for that in Chicago. So uh, I think we're going to move on then to our last news item of the week. Um, so that is a, a not necessarily China related news item, but nonetheless a significant development. So that is a, a $30 million uh, investment by the Korean con South Korean conglomerate Hanhua into the, uh, into the flat panel antenna company Kaimeta. And so there's, it's going to take a little bit of context here to get to the crux of the matter. But basically, Kaimeta is a company that is developing flat panel antennas that are primarily going to be used for the LEO low Earth orbit broadband constellations that are currently being developed by a handful of companies. And the idea here is that if you're going to have companies like Starlink or Amazon or uh, or, or China, indeed, um, launching thousands or tens of thousands of satellites trying to deliver broadband, um, those satellites are not going to be very useful unless you have a scalable and cost-effective terminal on the ground to receive that broadband connectivity. And currently, we have no such terminal, as it were. And Kaimeta has been one of the leading companies in, in developing such a terminal. So they're now, um, they're, they're, well, they've been developing these terminals for about five or six years. They have previously attracted funding from, uh, from Bill Gates, among others. So we have Kaimeta as one of the leading developers of these terminals that we have not yet developed yet, as it were. Uh, on the other side here, we have Hanhua, which is a South Korean conglomerate. It's one of the largest companies in, in the country. And they have previously acquired another company called Phasor that also manufactures these, or that is developing these flat panel antennas. So, so Hanhua is sort of dipping its toe now into the, the antenna market. And this $30 million investment is, is quite significant, I think. And, and I think it, it, it's a, um, it, it helps to consider what are some of the things that the South Korean economy does very well. And if we look at, at the South Korean Chebol, the sort of very large um, conglomerates that, that run very large percentages of the economy, um, one of the things they do very well is they make very large investments into um, manufacturing facilities for complicated hardware. They're just very good at industrial engineering and at, at making these very long-term investments. There's a lot of financing available because Korea has a very high savings rate. And, and so this is definitely something that um, seems to be, if not in the South Korean wheelhouse, it, it certainly could be uh, helped by, by South Korean competencies. And so I think when we look at this, this sort of developing, um, uh, you could call it a consortium here of kind of Kaimeta and, and Hanhua having acquired Phasor and, and the potential um, for cooperation with the LEO constellations in, in the US, 
uh, we're going to really start to see an ecosystem developing. And it, it therefore kind of leads you to ask, well, who would be doing that on the Chinese side? And, and what is you know what is going on in China as it relates to the development of these terminals? Because again, China is developing their own uh, low Earth orbit broadband constellations, and they will need terminals just as much as, as the rest of uh, the world will. And one of the companies that we've seen in China has been CETC, the China Electronics Technology Corporation. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, we, we have not seen as much development in China yet because I think the Leo terminals, uh, sorry, the Leo constellations in China um, are not as advanced um, as they are in the West yet. Um, but uh, yeah, so Sean, anything on your side from, uh, you know, on flat panel antennas or on just sort of the Leo antenna picture in general in China and mm. the West? Um, I, I know I, I covered a lot of ground there, so. But I think that definitely we would expect China, some Chinese companies to work uh, extremely hard on producing their own versions of uh, what Chimera and what, what Phaser and what these other antenna companies are building, uh, especially since I think it's a quite... Um, critical technology to to master and and that China would want to um, avoid reliance on, um, on on foreign companies for for this sort of terminals and um, I think one company that you mentioned that definitely will be the central Chinese player in building these antennas is is CTC and this makes me think of when I when I visited the Zhuhai Air show in 2018 while not directly about um, these flat panel antennas um, they had CTC had this gigantic booth uh, in, in this exhibition. And in 2018, they revealed um, some connectivity hardware that, were, that, that they were building for the aerospace industry. And, and this included um, a phased array antenna, extremely low profile phased array antenna that was specifically for commercial aircraft. And this is uh, some technology that we have not seen in China before, where most antennas uh, still had a number of mecha mechanical parts. And this just shows that China and CTC definitely are trying to um, push out their own products, uh, may it be in connectivity, hardware, or may it be in, in well, in the aerospace sector, I would think of in-flight um, in entertainment. Um, and going back to the flat panel antennas uh, you mentioned, I would think that at the end of the day, what would make Chinese companies competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis these, um, you know, these these foreign solutions would be their capacity to match um, their foreign competitors in terms of per performance. So that would be um, weight, that would be power consumption, that would be size, I would guess. All these are critical things. And um, there's also... Uh, I guess price be able being able to manufacture on scale and bring the price down to make this affordable, especially if we're looking at um, applications that are linked to the general public. Um, and and finally, I guess if we're in more restrictive um, regulatory environments such as aerospace, it would be the ability to certify these antennas to make them um, you know be used beyond just China. And I do wonder to what extent the development of these antennas in China would be accelerated by the availability of Starlink antennas now. Because, for example, I've seen some really interesting YouTube videos of some teardowns of the existing Starlink antennas, and it shows some really pretty, um, pretty elegant and innovative technology being used in these antennas, things that you would not have necessarily thought of. Now, I don't know if... Um, if all of those technologies were already being developed by by China, but I, I do think, um, as we've seen in 2020, the acceleration of Starlink in the West has seemingly led to the Chinese government to notice and and add satellite internet to the the new infrastructures list of the NDRC. Now I don't know if those two things are related, but I suspect they may be. Um, so I, I do think moving forward, we're, we're likely to see some significant emphasis on, on this ground terminal side. And, and just one last point to close it out, and, and I'm go, going back to your, your point about CETC. So one of the, the policies that um, the Chinese government has has undertaken is this Tian Di Yi Ti Hua, so this sort of uh, uh, sky and ground integration um, uh, policy of, of trying to basically uh, again, create a, a ground infrastructure to support the billions and billions of dollars that China has invested in launching a lot of space infrastructure and, and will continue to do over the next several years. I mean, going back to the, the, the point I mentioned at the beginning of, of this particular um, news item, it doesn't really matter how many cheap satellites you're able to launch into low Earth orbit to provide broadband internet. If you don't have a, a cheap and scalable user terminal, it, it's not going to be very useful to anyone. And so certainly this, uh, this, this ground terminal game in, in the context of, of these low Earth orbit constellations is definitely an area to watch over 2021, I think. Um, anything else from your side, John? I'm all good. 
Excellent. Well, if you've made it this far, we encourage you to check out our recent interview with Landspace. If you have not done so already, it is available on our YouTube channel, along with all of our other weekly news updates and previous episodes. Also, be on the lookout for our interview with ComSat, which will be published later this month. And if you have not done so already, please give us a like, follow, comment, or tweet at us. We're always, uh, we're always happy to hear from you. So this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour, China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by Jean Deville, and uh, Happy New Year. Bye.